Want to make some radical changes to your body in just 30 days? You can with one step. One simple step, simply avoid ultra-processed foods. Now, 30 days isn't long. It's not much. But if you avoid them completely for 30 days, some pretty magical things will happen. That's what we're going to talk about in today's episode. Yeah, this, radical. You know, okay, so... Um, I'll tell you why I picked this uh, this episode. So we have we have somebody that helps us piece together what our audience wants to listen to, and he tends to give us some. He'll give us advice and, and suggestions, and some you know we like, some we don't. This one I really like because I and I've said this on other podcasts. I've been on other shows and been interviewed, and and I often will say the following: that I think if you had to pick one thing, if you had to pick one factor that you could place the obesity and poor health epidemic squarely on. I don't think it's just one factor. I want to be clear. But if I had to pick one that had the biggest impact, it would be ultra-processed foods. I think ultra-processed foods represent a, a significant percentage of the obesity-related health issues that we're experiencing mm -hmm. in modern Western societies. And there's a lot of data uh, to support this. So I think... I don't, I don't necessarily think making radical changes are a great long-term approach, but I do like this one because if you are going to make one big change, what makes it valuable is if it gives you a big return. Yeah. And, and I can't think of a lot of things that won't give you as big of a return in a shorter period of time, like 30 days. I mean, that's only a month, uh, like this one. Like yeah. this one makes a big one. Doug, can you look up for me... Uh I'd be curious about the, and I don't know what, how you would search this. New Sal, you're the better Googler. Uh, I'm the Googler. Yeah, the, the Googler. You're, the, you're the champion Googler here. He's a Batman but villain. I'm looking for the total success from Whole30. The company, either general, like general, give me a general like revenue with how much they make per year or how many people they've this reached. This is a big part so, of what they do. This is. And th this is the point I'm gonna, I was going to make was that this is the uh, proof of of what you're, what you are uh, talking about right now is that this whole entire brand is built around this premise, mm -hmm. around Whole 30, which is eating whole foods for 30 days, mm -hmm. and basically watch what happens by doing that. And I've had several family members that this is like their go to whenever they get back in the swing of things is like because it worked so well. Yeah, it's simplicity. Um, it's focused effort uh, into something that. Uh, transponds it there's so many other factors that that play into this it's like prepping the food so it's like you have to actually like go to the store you have to um, do a bit of of work in order to prepare meals it, it sort of gets you back into that mindset of like making healthier choices just because of this selection process uh it slows things down a little bit you know we get really um caught up in in the ease of of all these convenience foods and things that we're just kind of eating on the go. And, uh, you know, we're, we're less conscious. I think that's a big part of it is bringing that consciousness back. A hundred percent. We just had a, a recent, uh, weekly call with our GLP one clients that are going through that. And the, one of the clients was struggling with, you know, even though the cravings and stuff aren't there, but then they still have these behaviors around reaching towards getting ice cream and, and then catching themselves doing it and going, what am I doing? I'm not even hungry. I don't even have the cravings yet. I have this behavior, do that. And one of the strategies is, is that each of us gave, we gave different uh, different strategies to help this person. But, you know, the one the common theme that they all were like was creating a, a boundary or a barrier Right. And simply having to eat whole foods creates a natural one. Yep. Yeah. You, know, you can't just reach in, in the in the cabinet and open up a wrapper and, and put it in your mouth, right? Or, or drive through somewhere and, and and conveniently just pick it up. It's like if you want to eat something, like you have to prepare it. And some of that can be simple and basic and eating it, but that simple barrier of I've got to put it together, make it, prepare it, uh, is brings you present. And I think a lot of times having to do that is enough to get people to become aware of the decision they're about look, to make. Look, I, 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 what you guys are saying definitely has value, but I don't think it's anywhere near as important as what you guys are saying, and I'll explain why. So it is going to be a bit of a counter. If you look at the studies done on ultra-processed foods, and real quick, we'll define what they are, right? What are ultra-processed foods? These are foods that are in boxes and wrappers. They have a lot of ingredients. They're created foods. They're not a food that you pick or grow or that Typically runs. Typically engineered, swims. yeah. It's an engineered food. A Cheeto is 
is a processed food. Um, a protein bar, even though it's a health food, is a processed food. Chips, cookies, um, frozen foods that are ready to go, like those are all processed foods. Now, here's where the counter is going to come from. I There's a lot of studies now that are done on this. And in, in some of them, what they did is they take people and put them in different rooms. And one room is heavily processed foods and the other room is whole natural foods, also convenient and easily and to, easy to eat and readily available. Okay. So the only difference is that one room has heavily ultra processed foods, foods in boxes and wrappers and so on. And the other one is whole natural foods that are also easily accessible. They didn't go and prepare them. They're already prepped, they didn't go yeah. pick them out. They're prepped. It's ready to go. There's apples, oranges, bananas, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds. There's, you know, meats that are prepared, eggs, that kind of stuff. So forget the convenience for a second. Here's yeah. what they find in the studies. And by the way, those groups of people then switch rooms. They're just trying to make sure that maybe it's not the group that we pick. And there's lots of studies on this now. They eat 500 less calories. F five to 600 less calories a day Yeah, for meeting whole natural yeah. foods. So it's not the convenience. I think the convenience plays somewhat of a role. We'll get to that. But it's not that. What it is is that ultra-processed foods, if you look at the research and development and money that goes into them, if you were, if you went to a snack food company, okay, and they created a new blockbuster, I don't know, Cheeto-type food or a cheese cracker or something, and you looked at their R&D, where's all the, all the R&D going? It would be in two major places. The big one is research and development on how to make it as palatable as possible. Taste and texture. Taste, texture, smell, feel, mouth feel, wrapper, residue yeah. it leaves on your fingers. Sound, everything. Like, like all the things you could possibly consider, they've yeah. got it down to, it's the it's one of the most Perfect studied- dust. Listen, it's one of the most studied sciences that exists. Food scientists, by the way, many food scientists came from the cigarette industry. When, that, when, the, when the tobacco industry got hammered, they moved to the food industry and these same scientists went into, how do we make food as ir irresistible as possible? And they use all kinds of tricks and techniques and chemicals and, and all kinds of different things to do this. And they've been very successful. The other place that they spend money is marketing. That's it. But almost <laughs> most of it is in this research, research and development. How do we make a food as irresistible as possible? Like, what does that mean? What makes something irresistible? What is it in me that makes me eat something. Why is it that I can eat a bag of Lay's potato chips and I could totally do that, but I couldn't eat four or five plain boiled, uh, uh, boiled potatoes? Why? One of them is irresistible. The other one, I'll gag after two potatoes. Or, no, you, would, you couldn't force me to eat more than two plain boiled potatoes. Well, what is it? It's because the food, the potato chips, are engineered to light parts of my brain up. Now, they, they don't necessarily know this is what's happening. They do now, but... They're just like, they'd have people test them. And what makes it tastier? What makes it tastier? Now, now they're down to the point where they're like dopamine, serotonin, mouthfeel, like all these different ratings and, and rankings. And, and essentially, it's creating drug-like effects in the body, making you irresistibly wanting to eat more and reach for them more. That's the big problem. Now, why do these foods exist in the first place? Well, processed foods originally were invented because they had a long uh, shelf life. And so, and there's value in that, right? We got to ship food to soldiers overseas. This is where a lot of processed food uh, was. It originated. was it war times that oh, yeah. ori originally kicked off like processed food. Was that the original mm -hmm. like? That's the main investment originally. Was that how do we get food to soldiers? It was canned foods mm -hmm. uh, majority. Spam, for example, spam is a a oh, staple yeah. now. It's like it's considered a Hawaiian staple. For yeah. example, <clears throat> how did it get there? Soldiers. Soldiers. It's not an original, you know, Polynesian Hawaiian dish. It's because soldiers stationed there brought it over, and now it became a part. Is that of, really of the true? Culture. Is that yeah. why? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's Absolutely. interesting. Spam was made for that. Coca Cola that that basically built them right after or World War One. Coca Cola or? is one of the most uh, world renowned, you know, um, you know, recognized brands in the world uh, because of its its palatability. It's so. Irresistible. But <laughs> I mean, they, they did use cocaine at the beginning. <laughs> that hey, helps. That's a bit of an advantage hey, too. <laughs> that tells you a lot. That, that tells you a lot about repeat customers. Right, you know, right. About what's going on. Right. Right. But these uh, these foods. Uh, yeah, there it is. During World War Two. Oh, right? World War Two. Yeah. Okay. These foods have a long shelf life, so there's some value there. But then it's it's like okay, you have market demand, and what do consumers want? Well, they want food that's irresistible. Let's let's let's. This is a fact. Like if if you're amongst a bunch of friends. And you're deciding what to eat. What gets the decision? What food? What restaurant? What snack do we pick? 
it's not the healthiest. It's not the one that's easy to digest. Nobody even says that. Nobody cares about that. No. It's about what do we crave, everybody? Yeah. What do we enjoy the most? And so uh, this is a market demand that's so strong, in fact, that if you look at all food categories, all food categories, health food categories, doesn't matter. The top selling food products in these in all categories are the ones that are the most palatable. And it doesn't matter if it's a health food or not. And that's just what we want. So we have decades of market demand fueling billions and billions of dollars of research and development. It's created these Franken foods that are absolutely irresistible to the point now where the average American, 60 to 75% of their diet is, is processed foods. A majority. It was not like that decades ago. Decades ago, it was a small percentage. Today, it's a majority. And it makes you overeat. So it's no wonder. You have to you have to share a little more about um, like you're right now you're explaining a really good job with like the the, the science the engineering and making it hyper palatable right, but you also have to because w- the science that I was unaware of was the ability for it to almost hijack your body's natural systems that tell you you're full. That's for, right. The first time this was became really apparent to me was man versus food. There's a there's a season where he was eating a a, a bathtub or a, a sink, sink of yeah. ice cream, mm-hmm. and that was like the, the challenge. Yeah, can you finish it? And he's like so stuffed that he's going to throw up, and he's he's almost not going to complete the challenge. Now, logically, this does not make sense. He goes, he orders a side of French fries, extra salty French fries, to help him finish ice cream. Now, the average person like me has to be thinking the same thing. Like, wait a second, he's overstuffed and full. He can't finish this challenge of ice cream. So, what he's going to do is go eat salty French fries, and that's supposedly going to help him eat more, huh? Yeah. Like you have to explain because I don't think people understand that's the type of research that's going into these foods. It's a novelty stimulus. So it hij- right. So not only does it taste amazing going down, mm-hmm. but then it hijacks these systems that we have in the body that go, "Hey, you're full. That's enough. That's you don't right. need to eat anymore." That's yeah. right. So what happened in that situation is he he hit what's called palate fatigue. Palate fatigue is a combination of different things. One of which is the actual fullness of your stomach. The other one is that you're getting the same experience over and over again. And eventually your body goes, that's that's enough. So what he did is he changed the experience. And he went from sweet, uh, creamy ice cream to yeah, crunchy. Sweet, sweet, fatty over right, to salty. To crunchy, salty potato uh, uh, french fries, which changed, gave him some novelty, allowed him to go back mm-hmm. and eat the ice cream, even though it was uh, more food. So we do have uh, something called palate fatigue. We do have something called satiety that is real. And you got to understand that we didn't evolve. There's a lot of people that believe that we as humans are just eating machines. You just put food in front of us. We'll eat until we explode. That's not the case because you would have been, it, it would have been more dangerous to overeat at one sitting, you know, a thousand years ago than it would be today. Like you have a blocked, you know, your gut gets blocked or, or constipation or severe gastro issues. Like where are you going? Yeah. You, know, you get diarrhea, you're dying. You know, diarrhea, in fact, killed people yeah. quite a bit back in the day. So our bodies have these natural systems that tell us to stop. What heavily processed foods do very well is they surpass that to the point where you end up eating. This is what the data shows. When you eat ultra processed foods, you eat them faster and you eat them longer. You end up eating more. By the time that signal kicks in that says, don't eat anymore, like that's enough. You are be above and beyond where you would be with whole natural foods. And this is why we've all had this experience where there's something, whatever your food is. For me, it's potato chips. We'll all be eating them, eating them, yeah. eating And I'll literally be like, what am I doing? There has to be something to that in terms of the speed of it. Like, in ter- like so Pringles, for instance, if I could just eat those instead of like, you know, a, a potato, a baked potato. Yeah. Like, that's going to take me a while to kind of get through it. And by the time I'm done, I already ate like two potatoes worth of chips. And it just happened so quickly. And it, I mean, yes, the flavor and then the, you know, they can trick you with like stuff like that and the crunch. But uh, I, I honestly think, too, that's a big factor is just the, the, the mindless part of it. That's part of it. But the other part is, uh, you know, if I were here feeding you baked potato and someone else were doing a study where they were feeding someone potato chip, you would still eat less yeah. of the baked potato. Yeah. So um, it's literally these are foods that are largely engineered to become so irresistible that you overeat them. And that's, of course, of course, they're going to be designed that way. That's what they're, they're trying to do is sell more product. And you as a consumer buy more of this product. 
So that's why they're they are a problem. So the question is, what happens when I don't eat them? Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, we have a free guide. It's the benefits of eating whole foods. This gives you a shopping list: what foods are best for proteins, fats, carbohydrates. There's recipe samples. It's all based on real, whole, natural foods, and it's a free guide. It's totally free. You can get it if you go to wholefoodsguide.com or by clicking on the link in the description below. Can I just, because there's a lot of diets out there with rules, right? Don't eat carbs, don't eat this, don't eat that, eat this. But what if you just followed one rule, right? What if you just followed one rule for 30 days? What rule would you follow and would it have profound impacts on your health, how you looked and all that stuff? For sure. And the answer is yes. And the answer is avoid ultra pro. Like if you, all you did was this for 30 days, you'll notice a few different things. Now, the first thing that you're going to notice, this one's an interesting one is that at first, your cravings will actually spike. The first thing you'll notice when you don't eat the hmm. chips you have every day or the That's candy withdrawal. that you have, you're going to crave them more it's because withdrawal. there's a classic withdrawal yeah. mm -hmm. um, symptom that happens. Which, by the way, is like another like red flag right away of like, wow, <laughs> how much this food has a hold of me yeah. that I go through this little transitional period. And for me, it was seven to 14 days for clients. Yeah. I, I would tell them like typically the first it's seven about a of, week usually. Yeah. yeah. Seven to 14 days. They, they are like this and it obviously gets better over time. Right. So maybe the person who actually takes 14, it's not as ravenous as it was on day three, mm -hmm. but at, there is for sure a withdrawal period, just like a drug addict who's quitting a drug when they first, when they first get away from it, and it gets easier over time. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. So at first your spike, your, your cravings will go up, but then at, as the withdrawal subsides, which I agree with you, Adam, it's about seven to 14 days. So about a week to two weeks into this 30 day trial, you'll find that your cravings will then drop and you'll find that you'll start to actually taste food differently. Because ultra processed foods hit you with so many sensations that are, they're all engineered in there. You actually downregulate receptors and change the way you perceive things. So let's say you're a big candy eater. Yeah. Well, you'll crave it at first. Then the cravings will start to drop. Then you'll eat fruit, which probably take bland, plate taste bland to you if you eat a lot of candy now. All of a sudden though, fruit will taste much sweeter. So after the first or second week, you'll find that your whole natural foods will start to taste better. Whereas at first- mm -hmm. They're probably going to taste bland. At first, it's going to be like this is not, this is not nearly as enjoyable. And your gut bacteria has to play a factor in this as well, right? After you start to kind of reintroduce these whole foods, which repopulate your yep. gut with other bacteria, now that start to kind of take over, you're starving the ones that were craving those other specific ultra processed foods. Those are starting to kind of like siphon out. Like that whole transition. Uh, has to has to be a part it of it. It is. And you, and you actually just skipped a couple steps, but we'll get to that one, which is one of the things you'll notice is your digestion will improve. Mm -hmm. Your digestion improves with whole natural foods. They're not pre-digested. They're not smashed together, tons and tons of ingredients. Uh, the fiber in there is naturally occurring. There are prebiotics in whole natural foods that are naturally occurring. These are things that feed good bacteria. And within 14 days or so, your digestion starts to change as your internal microbiome starts to change to match what you're eating. And then you start to notice you're more regular, you're less bloated, you don't have as much gas. Huh, I just feel a lot better from a digestive well, standpoint. Well, sticking to your point around mm -hmm. the science and the cravings and what that is like, this is th this understanding the science, it was a big part of the motivation behind why I was so strict with my son and eating sweets early on. Was knowing that I'm at a right now. I'm had this opportunity mm -hmm. when he's so young. I choose all his food that I can start to train his palate, and so things like fruit, like yogurt, are like huge treats for him. Totally, like he gets all those pleasure si signals, and it, it gets it's very enjoyable for him. It's like a treat that by training him to eat this way. And I remember you're actually training his brain. Because yes, his brain is developing. And it starts to develop around the foods he's experiencing as a kid. So you're literally training his brain. And this, I remember what it was like. So pre-contest, so before I had ever competed, um, I would uh, openly talked about my sugar and candy addiction and ice cream stuff that I've had in my entire life. 
And uh, I was I never ate vegetables and I hated fruit. I thought fruit tasted so bland and plain that I never understood people that craved fruit. I was just like, oh, I just must be me genetically. I don't. It wasn't until I eliminated all that processed food and ate like this for a period of time. And then all of a sudden, like all those, it's like I opened up a whole category, two categories of foods. I had no idea that I could like, and it was all because I had been slamming my 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 flavor palette with highly processed sugary foods for so long that something that has natural sugar in in like fruit and vegetables was just like here tastes like nothing. I'll, I'll give you an example to back you up. Right, we can all we all know what a strawberry tastes like. Do you guys know what candy strawberry tastes like? <laughs> what about grape versus straw like candy grape or watermelon mm. versus candy watermelon? It's so funny because with my kids, same thing. We don't eat a lot of candy. So we had these lollipops that we would use when we go to church to keep them to sit there while the guy, yeah. while, the, while the preacher was talking. And so we bought these lollipops and my son goes, what flavor is this? And I said, grape. And he ate it and he's like, this doesn't taste like grape. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's candy grape. It's yeah. not really grape. Yeah. yeah, It's candy grape. It's totally different. Yeah. The next thing that you'll notice, this one is going to get people excited, is you're probably going to lose some weight. You're probably going to end up losing some body fat as a result of, of just avoiding ultra processed foods. Not trying to cut calories, not trying to eat less, eat until you're full. By the way, I should have said that in the beginning. Avoid ultra processed foods and then don't worry about overeating. Just eat whole foods and eat as much as you want. You're, you're probably still going to lose some weight. In fact, this was my favorite, favorite, favorite trick and hack to do with my clients is I would tell them, eat as much as you want. Eat until you're full. I don't care. Just eat. Don't eat ultra processed foods. They'd all look at me like I was crazy. Like I can eat as much as I want, eat as much as you want. As long as it's not ultra processed, mm -hmm. and they'd all come to me and be and they'd lose weight, and they thought, they, this is what they would say to me: What do they put in processed foods that makes them so that makes them gain weight? Makes you gain weight with them? And it's like, there's no like fat storing or fat <laughs> producing chemical in there. You just eat more calories with them, and they'd say, No, I'm not. There's no way. I, I'm stuck. I'm eating like I'm full. I'm eating this huge dinner and lunch, and there's no way. And I said, Well, let's let's do the math. Let's calculate it out. And sure enough, their calories are lower. And that's for the first point that we talked about, which is ultra processed foods make you overeat. So when you eat until you're full, mm -hmm. but they're, they're whole and natural, you'll eat less calories naturally as yeah. well. And you're going to lose weight in 30 days just from doing that. I mean, this is just, this is the point or the study that you pointed out. Yes. I mean, this is just that they didn't control anything other than that. They flipped the groups and it was a great, great study where they did this and it was clear. Five to 600 calories is a significant number. I think people need to understand that. That's the, how much you normally put yeah, cut like, someone's calories. Like lose the weight. average, the yeah. average woman gains weight on like 1800 calories. Yeah. So if you think about that, that you're talking about a third of the calories in a day that someone would gain weight on is insane. And then the average, I think males like 2,500 or somewhere in that range. And so you're talking about a large percentage mm -hmm. yeah. of your daily caloric Surplus intake. Surplus just keeps adding yes. every day. Yes. So that is just a testament to that alone. And this has been uh, proven with every client that I've ever been able to do this. This is why this became one of my go-to like first like initial tips of telling clients, just stay away from that. It also does something you have to, you have to talk about, uh, the, the the psychological behavior thing that we've we've learned as coaches and trainers for so long is that there's something to be said about telling a client that they have all this freedom to eat and choose whatever you want so long as it's whole foods. Yes. You're not putting these like restrictions of like, even though you are restricting them to nothing but whole foods and say no processed foods. And you're also saying eat as much as you're, you Yeah, you're also saying, I'm not going to tell you weigh or measure. You can't have this. Like, just do that. And let's start with that. It still gives them this feeling of- They don't feel free. confined. That's right. They don't feel yeah. confined. They don't feel restrained. They don't feel they like they are restricted to only a couple foods that they can have. They're like, well, as long as I just, it's a whole food, like, okay, that seems fair and, totally. and, and logical. So there's a psychological part that's extremely beneficial to using this as a strategy. Totally. Too. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. The next thing that you'll notice, okay, so you lose some weight, your cravings spike, but then drop, your digestion improves. You'll probably also build some muscle. Now, of course, you should be strength training while you're doing this, but you're probably going to build some muscle. All right, what is it about whole natural foods that make them so muscle building? Well, it's not necessarily the magic of whole natural foods. It's that most processed foods are low in one key mac macronutrient, which is very important for building muscle, 
and that's protein. Mm-hmm. If you go through the processed food aisles of your grocery store, which is a majority of them, and you were to add up all the macronutrients, the carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, what you'll find the lowest is in protein. Besides protein bars and shakes, that's it. Like uh, the rest of them are mostly carbohydrates and fats. Um, you're not going to find lots of proteins. Protein is is a bit of an expensive nutrient. It's also a more difficult one to turn into a hyper palatable snack. Here's why, by the way, protein is satiety producing, or or, or it, it really does make you feel full. Defeats the the snack category. Uh, you know how they engineer it. That is a killer yeah. in the snack food market. They if I'm if I'm in a quick. if I'm in a boardroom trying to create a snack food. And I'm like, let's make a, a high protein snack food. They're gonna look at me like I'm stupid. Like, why? Why <laughs> would we do that? Finish the bag. Unless yeah. we're trying to target people who want to eat more protein, why would we add more protein? We know this as scientists. We know this for a fact that of the three macronutrients, pro- proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, proteins produce the most satiety. Why the hell would we add protein to our snack foods? We're just gonna make people eat less of them. So, vast majority of your ultra processed foods are low in protein. So a high ultra processed food diet is also simultaneously a low protein diet. And high carbohydrates. A high whole food diet that's omnivore, okay, I got to throw that in, for the most part tends to be a higher protein diet. So what you're going to find is naturally without necessarily trying, although we'll give some tips at the end here to make this even more effective, you're probably going to bump your protein while dropping your calories, more muscle, Less body fat sounds like a nice result. I also think that part of that is because it's uh, your when you're eating whole foods, some of the more palatable foods are healthy fats paired with protein. Yeah. yeah. So when you when you've decided that also looks like a meal. That's like, yeah. Why when I you when, you, when yeah. you decide okay, I'm going to go on this no process all whole foods. Well, that doesn't that means things like steak and chicken thighs and bacon and sausage and some of these foods are now accepted as foods that I can eat. And it's like mm-hmm. hey, those are tasty good foods they got healthy fats in it and so they're desirable you're not getting filled up by this you know cracker you know carbohydrate type of food in the box and so naturally you tend to eat more protein and that's without the advice that i know you're going to end up getting to because i know that we all have a strategy of what we would tell our clients that eat whole foods and do it in this order and it makes a world of a difference of hitting that protein by the the way just to kind of hammer that point home you know uh jerky is technically a processed food. Long shelf life comes in a bag. I don't know. Have you guys ever met anybody that overeats jerky where jerky becomes the yeah, problem? There's always at least half the bag left. It's yeah. because protein produces satiety. But when you eat whole foods, when you're constructing a meal, and I just witnessed, look, I just observed this on my clients. When my clients put together meals on their own without my influence, they tend to include some kind of a protein because I think we know naturally, uh, inherently, that that's a complete meal. So they tend to include some chicken or fish or eggs or steak or something uh, along those lines. All right, last thing you're going to notice in 30 days if you quit ultra-processed foods is that your skin will begin to clear up. Now, I'm not just saying this because I noticed this from observation, although I do, and my clients would always remark on this. There's actual data to support this. They've actually done studies on this, and several studies suggest that your skin begins to clear up when you're eating a whole food diet. Now, why? It's probably related to the improvement in your microbiome in your gut. There is a connection between the microbiome in your gut and the microbiome on your skin. Um, And also, there's a reduction in inflammation from a few different reasons. One is a reduction in calories that tends to reduce inflammation anyway. Improved digestion, that also reduces inflammation. And also the preservatives and chemicals that are put in ultra-processed foods to increase its palatability, either to make it look better, smell better, feel better, or taste better, or just last longer, some of these can cause inflammation in some individuals, and combinations of these can cause inflammation in some individuals. So it it starts to become a redu- a lower inflammation diet as a result. Inflammation definitely plays a role in skin problems. I was going to yeah. say, that's probably the, the most uh, common reason, right? It would be simply that most... Uh, skin issues are either autoimmune or liver type of stuff, and both your gut and liver are when you are in a state that is inflamed are going to be stressed yep. and more likely going to have your skin issues. Where simply being in a five to six hundred caloric deficit 
eating foods that are not highly palatable and processed right away, I would think that that would just, just for those reasons, not to mention what, cause I know there's a lot of, um, th there's a, a lot of people that believe that there's chemicals or certain things that are in the processed foods that are pot potentially causing that, but it's most likely due to the overconsumption of, of calories and food and then the inflammation. I, you know, it's a combination of all those things because you're right. Some people are more sensitive than others, but it's really yeah. hard to say when you, you know, if you, you can identify or study individual preservatives and color additives, by the way, um, it's some color additives now have been established Red to induce, dye, yeah, yeah like, like to induce hyperactivity in kids. Yes. Or I know some of my kids, I notice a difference with certain ones. Um, but what we don't know is the milieu or the, the mix in combination of all these different things and how that affects a lot of people. But there's lots of speculation. Again, there's studies that have done this and they see improvements in skin. And in my observation with clients, they tend, even the, by the way, clients don't tend to go on this diet or do this because they're trying to improve their skin. They don't hire me for that. They tend to hire me to get in better shape. But what they tend to say is, wow, I'm noticing better skin as well. Well, isn't it some of it's too like the hydrogenated like oils, some of the yeah. stuff they cook with, you know, these like ultra processed um, foods. And so, I mean, yes, chemicals, like I get that argument, but too, like they've like trans fats and there's yeah. all these other things that uh, may be a factor to that that could, in, yeah, could, could cause inflammation. Completely. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's October. MAPS Muscle Mommy is 50% off, half off. If you're interested, click on the link below. All right, back to the show. All right, so here's some tips when you're doing this. If you're going to follow this challenge for the next 30 days that we're presenting, number one, um, make sure you always have a protein with your meals. So when you're preparing your whole natural meals, throw a protein in there, like eggs, chicken, fish, beef, cottage cheese, cheese, milk, you know, uh, all the, the, the traditional sources of protein. Throw them in there because that'll really ramp up the value that you're going to see from this in 30 days. Well, and the next layer to that, and what I know we would all recommend on this is eat it first. Yeah, eat the protein first, thanks. So just simply making sure it's in the diet and saying, I'm going to eat that first. And this strategy was so powerful for me. It always used to blow clients' mind because they're like, wait a second. I'm like, well, how much of this can I have or how much of that can I have? I'm not going to tell you how much you can or can't have of that. I just want you to do this for me. Make sure you eat whole foods. Every meal, make sure it's centered around a protein and eat it first. After that, if you're still hungry, yep. enjoy enjoy the carbohydrate, enjoy the other things that are that are with the dish. Just eat that first. And that strategy alone served my clients so much. Now that's that, why the restaurant industry does it the opposite order. That's right. It yeah, is. They, they don't you serve the you chips. They don't the serve you steak first. first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They want you to increase your appetite. Yeah. That's right. Uh next is to pre-make your meals. Okay, so one of the potential disadvantages of whole natural foods is they require some prep. Now, this isn't true for all of them, right? Like fruits, uh, some vegetables, uh, certain dairy products you could just eat. You know, you know, a container of cottage cheese is, you know, you throw some fruit in there, boom, boom, you got yourself a meal. Can of tuna fish, you could throw it in a bowl, add some mayonnaise, have some fruit on the side, some vegetables, pretty quick. But uh, oftentimes getting a meal means requiring some prep. So go ahead and pre-make your meals because the thing that will get in your way most often over the next 30 days, if you follow this, is if you run into a situation where, uh oh, I don't have food, I gotta go to the vending machine, I gotta go buy something uh, over there, and now you're off this 30 day challenge or whatever. I, I can't stress that enough. One of the, one of the uh, most challenging parts of this, because everybody will probably have this within the week, and especially when we're talking about that first seven to 14 days, when the cravings are really strong, and then you don't have kind of your meals planned out for the day. This is when when most people fall off. Yep. Is oh they decide I'm gonna do this whole this whole thirty thing, and I'm gonna stick to the whole foods for the next thirty days, and they have a good start to the first few days, and then the first challenging day happens. It's day four or five into this, cravings are really starting mm -hmm. to kick up because they've they've kicked out this processed food, and now they have their first busy day where it's like they had to work for five hours straight, they didn't get a break, and then they don't have something in front of them to eat. And and then they go, ah, and then they, that's where they make their decision to drive through somewhere or eat something in a wrapper. So I can't stress enough how uh, much the prepping part is helps 
you be successful, especially in the first seven to 14 days when those cravings are really powerful and you feel that kick up and then you don't have something prepared for you. It's that much more difficult for you to go like, oh my God, I'm so hungry. It's been five hours since I've ate. Those cravings are kicking me. And now you're telling me I need to go to the grocery store and go put something together and, and make mm -hmm. it where I could just pull over real quick and go through drive through here. This is where most people uh, fail. And if you at least plan to have your meals out and you make them, this will really help you be successful in this. Totally. Lastly, you're going to probably, uh, unless otherwise instructed by your doctor, you're going to probably want to add electrolytes to your water. Um, and the reason for that is ultra processed foods are all very high in sodium. And so this automatically is going to dramatically lower your sodium. Now that can be a problem for a lot of people. If you go from a a lot of sodium because 70, 80% of your diet's ultra processed. Now the next 30 days, I'm going to go with no processed foods. So you go high sodium to low, even if you salt your, your whole natural foods, it's mm -hmm. not going to come close to the amount of sodium that's in your ultra processed foods. If you do that big drop, you'll get an electrolyte imbalance and then you'll notice headaches, fatigue, muscle cramps. And a lot of people explain it away and they say things like, oh, I'm going through withdrawal or, or oh, keto flu. Or no, 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 no. You just add some salt. Uh, to your water, add some electrolytes to your water, and you'll feel a lot better. I, I, this nine out of ten times when I had a client do this, I would mm -hmm. have them add electrolytes to the water. Otherwise, they tended to fall, you know, fall into some. I've problem. especially noticed this in my real active clients. You Definitely, know, you know, that went from the ultra process to now like whole foods. It was like wow, the dramatic uh, increase in their performance once they added those electrolytes. I think most everybody is going to need to do this for the most part, unless there's an exception to the rule, like medically, right? Something going on. Uh, is going to benefit from this. Definitely a must for the people that know that like, they're like, I eat a lot of processed foods. I eat out every single night or multiple times a day. That person is going to have a dramatic shift in the amount of soda. Even if they salted every one of their meals like a lot. It doesn't even compare. It doesn't even come close to what it looks like if you were eating out every day or multiple times a day. So that person, this is going to be so, so important. Totally. All right. A couple um, things I'd like to add to this. Um, sandwiches are not whole natural foods. Bread in general, probably not in the category of whole natural foods. And a lot of people are like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll have a sandwich. That seems like I'm preparing it. Probably not. Good sources of carbohydrates, rice, potato, beans, fruits, vegetables, proteins, uh, you know, uh, chicken, fish, beef, eggs, dairy, all good sources. Um, nuts and seeds are great as well. Those can get overdone pretty quickly. So you don't want your whole natural food diet to be like based off of them. But um, other than, than that, I would say uh, just eat the whole natural foods, avoid all the processed stuff. I would stay away from the breads and sandwiches. Cause, and the reason why I'm adding that is I've had clients do that where they're like, I'm, I'm making sandwiches every day. I'm like, yeah. oh, that, oops, that doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention, it's, it also eliminates the other tip where we say eat the protein first and have it like, it ends up being a high carb, high carb That's meal. Right. A sandwich is more carbohydrates than it is protein. Most sandwich, even your large Subway sandwich from Togo's or whatever favorite, you know, Subway place that you would go to is four ounces of meat, which is yes. like hardly anything. Tiny. So, 80% of your calories are coming from carbohydrates. Very little is coming from protein, so it's not a protein-rich meal. And since you said that, I want to give the alternative for stuff people is like rice bowls are like used to be the go-to or salad bowls were like the go-to move for me to help clients that were used to having a quick, convenient sandwich for lunch every single day. And there's so many places now, like the Chipotle type of places and the Baja Freshes that you can go get a chicken, steak, rice, yeah. in a rice, potato, yam type of bowl that are really good tasting, really easy and convenient, and or those are also easy to build and make in bulk. Like my favorite thing to do for Katrina and I, this is what, I mean, literally what I ate today. You saw my, we actually used it in a crock pot. We do a bunch of like, you know, we do a couple pounds of chicken thighs in the crock pot. So like it makes it really, really tender and soft. And then we shred it all up and we make this like cilantro, almost like a, a burrito without the tortilla. And it's just rice. So it's just rice, chicken, cilantro, some tomato slices, even a little bit of avocado in there and basically make that into a bowl like these like burrito bowls minus the tortilla and you just you put it in the rice great great choice yeah and i mean so. what you're doing too is you're just cooking one big meal and then you have meals yes for all, all set up for the entire week that prepping like that and something simple easy also inexpensive rice and chicken thighs you can mm -hmm. buy in bulk 
and are, are relatively inexpensive to do to do that. And uh, you can even add some black beans if you want to kick up the protein and some flavor in there. Like, great, great choice for a, a staple lunch every day for somebody. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat for men. This is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.